Hello and welcome back to Pick Some Portraits. Today, we are heading back to the 2000s with yet another network animation retrospective, this time looking at Spike TV 2003 and the trio of cartoons that, in a way, helped launch that channel. We will get to the cartoons in just a bit, but first I'd like to give some background on Spike, uh, how it came to be and what it was going for, especially in 2003, uh, because boy, does it ever add a lot of context. It began 20 years earlier as TNN, the Nashville Network, a cable channel dedicated to country western content. <laughs> it initially broadcast out of Opryland, USA, a similarly themed theme park in Nashville. Now we are going to be talking a lot about demographics, or the demo, uh, that's going to be coming up again, so for clarification, regardless of platform, all content is generally organized by demographic or target audience. This affects everything from the content itself, obviously, to the type of sponsors it attracts and the type of people even that watch it, uh, and of course the ad rates it gets, meaning how much a sponsor is willing to pay to have their product advertised on a particular show. In American television, this is reflected or measured by Nielsen ratings, uh, which track not only how many people are watching television, but what share of them are watching whatever shows are running on any given day. Uh, they are categorized by age and gender, and certain programming is more lucrative based off these factors. So the Nashville Network, uh, target audience, obviously, <laughs> fans of country music, a lot of its programming revolved around live musical performances, and this can lean to an older demographic. Uh, also, TNN was not the first uh, or only cable channel dedicated to country music. Uh, there was also CMT, Country Music Television, which launched just two days uh, before TNN and had clearer and arguably stronger branding uh, for the product it was putting out. In the late 90s, TNN sought to diversify its audience and attempted to shift its programming towards a younger crowd. <laughs> this began with Roller Jam, an extreme update on Roller Derby, where competitors wore inline skates and shenanigans were encouraged. This took a lot from pro wrestling, which was hugely popular at the time. Uh, Roller Jam was actually paired with ECW on TNN. ECW uh, was the extreme punk rock alternative, if you will, to WWE, uh, WWF at the time. They were there together on Friday nights, along with other sports entertainment programming, and uh, was apparently pretty successful. As part of this shift to a younger audience, TNN was rebranded as the National Network and landed WWF Raw, one of the highest rated cable shows at the time. This led to their airing of the XFL, the now twice ill-fated football alternative produced by WWE. Uh, they also began running reruns of Baywatch, as well as Monster Jam, and it's probably becoming pretty clear the direction this is heading. The decision to fully relaunch into a male-oriented channel was made in 2003, when TNN would become Spike TV. The name, Spike TV, led to a lawsuit by director Spike Lee, who believe viewers may think that he was somehow involved with the channel. An injunction was ordered just three days before the advertised switchover. This would be resolved later in the year, but it did cause the network to postpone the relaunch. Eventually, a gala was held at the Playboy Mansion, but because of the lawsuit, they had to do a soft launch with the cartoons, and so we're going to be seeing some material that uses the TNN branding with Spike's eventual tagline, the first network for men. Now even if you don't subscribe to the idea of gender, it's clear there were TV networks curated or programmed to a specific set of interests. <laughs> Spike interpreted this in a certain way, um, but how? What exactly does it mean to be the first network for men? Well, let's explore that in a segment I am calling Mid-2000s Masculinity. <laughs> if you identified as male, 18 to 34, in 2003, what did advertisers and television producers think of you? First off, you're assumed straight, uh, guys like chicks, and a large part of Spike's branding focused on scantily clad women. You liked action movies and explosions. They would hold a Bond marathon over the Christmas season in 2003, dubbed the 007 Days of Christmas. Uh, you were into sports, or at the very least, sports entertainment, uh, like slam ball, which was a more extreme form of basketball <laughs> that involved trampolines. Uh, wrestling too, obviously, which we already talked about. Uh, WWE programming was all over Spike, uh, though TNA, or Impact, I think, will become more synonymous with the network. Cars. Ride with Funkmaster Flex was more or less Cribs for Cars. Uh, DJ Funkmaster Flex would visit various celebrities and have them show off their luxury or fancy cars. You also loved video games. 
Uh, now we touched on this in our recent Video Store Aesthetics video, but this period saw the emergence of the gamer archetype. Uh, this was a time where there wasn't hundreds of thousands of gaming podcasts and video games weren't so ingrained uh, in popular culture. Uh, so mainstream attention on the industry, at least in a positive or a celebratory light, uh, wasn't that common, uh, but the industry was exploding. Gaming was getting huge, and to capitalize on this, Spike produced the first annual Video Game Awards, or VGAs, in 2003, uh, hosted by Funkmaster Flex and David Spade. Uh, we will actually be covering this more in depth over on our Patreon, patreon.com slash Uh But yeah, the uh, cultural shift <laughs> between uh, 2003 and now is absolutely massive. So hopefully that gives you a good idea of what Spike's shtick was, and now let's move on to their big animation push. We are coming off the tail end of the second adult animation boom that followed the Simpsons success. Uh, we are also post-Adult Swim, and no doubt Spike intended their animation block to compete with them. There was a lot of talent involved with this, and it was treated like a very big deal. A large part of the network's launch revolved around these three shows. Gary the Rat, Ren and Stimpy Adult Party Cartoon, and Stripperella. Promos ran prior to the rebranding with personalities from the shows, having meetings with Spike executives. These follow similar scripting and formats with a couple variations, uh, one involving characters and another with the creator or producer of the shows. First, let's look at Gary the Rat. This was created by Mark and Rob Cullen and was produced by and starred Kelsey Grammer, uh, who had previous experience in voice acting, obviously Sideshow Bob on The Simpsons and The Prospector from Toy Story 2. This show revolves around a prominent Wall Street lawyer who one day inexplicably turns into a rat. Uh, the premise is based off of the expression the rat race, meaning cutthroat, you know, climbing the corporate ladder. Uh, Gary isn't the nicest person and hasn't done the best things to get his success, and this is his apparent punishment. It follows basic sitcom conventions and plots, uh, things like high school reunion, ex-girlfriend comes to town, and most episodes are framed around a specific case. Again, he's a lawyer. Uh, because of this, it's hard not to see it as a Harvey Birdman knockoff, uh, even though it began as a web series, uh, technically before Birdman's airing. Uh, it's a lot less absurd, with much of the humor revolving around Gary being a rat, uh, accepting Jesus payment, uh, that sort of thing. Kelsey Grammer's performance is probably the best thing we're going to be looking at uh, here in this whole video, actually, and Gary is probably the best of these three shows. Uh, still, it's very derivative and falls into the trap a lot of adult cartoons do, where it equates mean-spiritedness with wit. Um, beyond Gary being a rat, it also does very little with the possibilities animation offers and very easily could have been live action. Gary the Rat lasted just one season of 13 episodes, uh, which, spoiler, is going to be a pattern here. Up next, we have quite a doozy, Ren and Stimpy adult party cartoon. Everything about this is awful. Uh, this is a follow-up to the Ren and Stimpy show, one of the original Nicktoons, which first aired in 1991. This was a throwback to the golden age of animation in terms of presentation, with the in-your-face gross-out humor that was common in the 90s. It featured Ren and Stimpy, an erratic chihuahua, and dim-witted cat that would go on frequently surreal and sometimes disgusting adventures. It was created by John Crickfalusi, better known as John Kay, uh, who, for anyone who may not know, is allegedly a pedophile who used his position and the show to groom victims, uh, which is why I struggle to appreciate it. The show was obviously not limited to Crickfalusi. Uh, he was actually fired in 1992 for failing to meet the network's deadlines, and Billy West and Bob Camp certainly deserve credit for their input uh, on the show, but nothing that made the original series special can be found in an adult party cartoon. This is John Kay, alone and unfiltered, and it's absolute trash. He not only directed every episode, but provided the voice of both Ren and Stimpy, who are portrayed as lovers sometimes. Uh, there are plenty of jokes around domestic abuse. Where sexual innuendo or references were subtle in the original series, here they are blatant, uh, excessive even. <laughs> it looks cheap, like very little care went into it, uh, didn't even make one season, and was cancelled after just three episodes aired. Uh, these would be released on DVD in 2006 with the remaining three unaired episodes. Uh, each had a special intro from Crick Falusi and a guest, one of which was Katie Rice, one of the women he allegedly groomed and later harassed, which, needless to say, is extremely uncomfortable to watch. Uh, and yeah, uh, that's about enough of that. Rounding out the trio is Stripperella. This was produced by Stan Lee. Yes, 
that's Stanley, and starred Pamela Anderson as Erotica Jones, a stripper by night, and a superhero, Stripperella, by even later at night. Stripperella is employed by a secret organization known as Thug. She is Agent 0069. Her powers include being attractive, uh, her hotness can apparently set perps on fire, as well as power breath. Uh, she at one point uses uh, this to save a monkey from a tank. Some plot lines include Stripperella battling Dr. Caesarian, a plastic surgeon who intentionally makes supermodels fat, and the bridesmaid who, tired of being a bridesmaid, kidnaps other people's grooms. This was some of the only footage that I could find, but apparently she also faced off against a money-conscious villain known as Chipo, who is voiced by John Lovitz, which sounds like a lot of fun. Uh, the show is full of sexual innuendo uh, and even nudity uh, that, of course, would be blurred on television. Uh, it also apparently had PSA-style messages concerning animal rights, which is on brand for Anderson. <laughs> like the network itself, it ran into some legal issues regarding its name, Stripperella. A former dancer, Janet Clover, alleged she discussed the idea with Stan Lee during a private dance a year before the series debuted. Clover filed a lawsuit against Lee, Anderson, and Spike's parent company, Viacom, uh, claiming the idea was stolen. Uh, I couldn't find any uh, verified source on how this was resolved, um, but I'm guessing the suit was dismissed. Like Gary the Rat, it lasted just 13 episodes. The interest just wasn't there uh, for any of these shows, really. Now, we set out to cover 2003 and Spike's initial animation lineup. Uh, that failed. <laughs> but before we wrap this up, I want to quickly look at a show that debuted the following year, titled This Just In. This was created by Kevin Kay and Steve Marmel, both of whom had previously worked on shows for Cartoon Network and Nickelodeon. This Just In was born out of some apparent conservative persecution complex. <laughs> it is centered around a newspaper columnist, Brian Newport, who hates Tina Fey and worships Bill O'Reilly. The show's producers were apparently unhappy uh, with portrayals of conservatives in media. According to them, unlike conservatives in other shows uh, that were portrayed as religious zealots or buffoons, their character is smart, <laughs> which I think is debatable. I think it's wild that in a post-9-11 world, at the height of the W years, uh, that they could believe uh, the opinions here countered anything in terms of public opinion. Uh, these were all very accepted, widespread beliefs that, at the time, could be found in similar shows even. Family Guy, for instance. <laughs> it was created with Flash and intended to replicate South Park's formats of a quick week or so turnover, uh, allowing them to comment on recent events more or less as they were happening. Like South Park, they also claim to parody both sides of the political spectrum, uh, though also, like South Park, it lays much more into liberals than conservatives. The episode I watched was called Iraqathon and featured Newport organizing a telethon to support the troops in Iraq uh, because the military was broke. A subplot revolves around Newport's group of friends wanting to see Hellboy. One of the characters is quote-unquote whipped and lives in constant fear of his wife. He is ridiculed because he has to see Mean Girls instead of Hellboy. Popular left-leaning celebrities are lampooned, Michael Moore and Moby, which I feel like by 2004 were already tired punching bags. Bill O'Reilly makes an unauthorized appearance, Newport fantasizes about purchasing the bomb uh, that will kill Osama Bin Laden. O'Reilly has a similar fantasy about bombing Paris. Uh, this was around the time of Freedom Fries, and uh, yeah, this is pretty awful. Also worth mentioning is Afro Samurai, which was broadcast on Spike in 2007 and is very tonally different from the other shows we've looked at. Uh, actually, pretty good as well. This was based off the manga by Takeshi Okazaki and starred Samuel L. Jackson, who actually hosted a few VGAs as a black samurai in a sort of futuristic feudal Japan, uh, also featuring music by the RZA, which is pretty cool. Today, Spike TV is known as the Paramount Network and has since distanced itself from exclusive man-centric programming. Reflecting on the failure of Spike's animation block, I feel like they tried too hard to be edgy and push boundaries uh, superficially with things like nudity and swearing, even though it was mostly censored. Um, they tried too hard to be offensive, uh, whereas the far more successful Adult Swim, you know, still somewhat edgy, developed its own brand of humor and identity. The problem with crossing boundaries is that once you do, what's next? Uh, you can only rely on shock for so long before the novelty is lost, and ultimately I think that's why these cartoons failed. Without the novelty, these tunes were painfully conventional, and there just wasn't much there. 
I will post links to relevant material in the description. If you enjoyed this video, give us a thumbs up. Please subscribe if you haven't. Also, if you like adult cartoons, we have an entire series dedicated to them over on Patreon, Century of Schlock. $5 a month gets you access to that and dozens of other videos, patreon.com slash portraits. As always, thank you so much for your interest in this channel, and thanks for watching. Stay safe out there.